Finally tonight, the young pitcher and the pep talk from his coach heard by millions. It's the biggest game of their young lives. Game from South Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the, first the Little League team from Bend, Oregon, in a battle with a team from Italy. Isaiah Bugsy Jensen on the mound. Hi, my name is Bugsy Jensen, and my favorite baseball player is Clayton Kershaw. 12-year-old Isaiah pitching a great game until he gets a little tired in the top of the fifth. Now he can take his base. Out comes his coach for a pep talk. But that coach just happens to be Bugsy's dad. I just came out to tell you how much I love you. As a dad and a player, okay? You're doing awesome out here. One more hitter and then I'm going to Juge. This is your last hitter, okay? You understand? Come right after. Hey, cheer up. Have some fun. Come right after. Okay? Let's go. One more batter before Bugsy's replaced. That pep talk from dad worked. Another strikeout, and the team goes on to win. And that's going to do it. Victory from nine players from Bend, Oregon, and one very proud dad. So we're in a series on uh, assurance. And I've tried to just think through, I, I, you know, it's funny because I don't know from week to week what I'm going to. I'm going to cover uh, in this. Somebody asked me yesterday, said, okay, what passage are you covering? And I'm going to cover a, a different kind of passage. But I, I, one of the things I would highly recommend to you, if you struggle with this issue of assurance, you, because the end of this series is this should not be a struggle. This, this should not be. A, you, you might struggle with uh, paying your rent or your mortgage. You might struggle with car payment. You might struggle, you know, at work. But this issue needs to be settled it, it needs to be settled and i would just encourage you to read uh in john the book of john because john was written to people who were uh who were not believers who were not in a church or anything like that and it was written and and specifically read chapters three four five and six and, and even eleven you can read read through there and and so many times John introduces us to these people. And we know some things about them, like Nicodemus is, is unusual in that we know his name. We know he was a religious leader. But then we meet this woman at the well. We meet this man at a pool. And, and we aren't given their names. And what John is doing is inviting us into their shoes to feel what they feel, to think about the world the way they think about the world, and to meet Jesus. And John says, the things I wrote in this book, I wrote so you can know that Jesus is the Son of God and you can have everlasting life because of that. And so um, I've just kind of been working my way through first John chapter 4 we looked at, and then we looked at um, a little bit of John chapter 5 and John 11 where uh, Lazarus is, is raised. We just looked at a part of that story. Last week we looked at the logic of assurance. It was for... for the cerebral people among us that just want to think through everything. We looked at logical syllogisms, and I encourage you to, uh, if you haven't seen that, look at that message because uh, it was just the logical facts of what assurance is. And then the podcast came in under that and followed that up, and, and I think you'll find that helpful as well. Today I want to tell, talk about the emotion of, of assurance. Because I, I dare say most of us, if, our, if we have a struggle with this issue, it's in the area of emotions. And so um, I, I want to talk about that in some real practical ways, but, but we're going to go there through our, our thinking, through the, the knowledge gate, you might say. One of the things that has happened in evangelical Christendom, and uh, <laughs> there's, some, there's some very good people people that I, I read and I admire and I like and you will hear this amongst these people that doubt is good in fact they'll say this that if you doubt your salvation if you have doubts about your salvation that's normal in fact I've, I've read somebody that said it's almost required that you doubt your salvation uh, one of the things I was reading was a guy said doubt is like um raisins you put in oatmeal and you mix it up so there's going to be doubts in there uh, i could not more categorically disagree with those statements i don't think that's what's that's what should go on 
Like I said, you can have doubts about a lot of things. You can have doubts about a lot of theological questions. You know, you can have doubt. Is Jesus coming back? You can, you can doubt that if you want to. I don't doubt that, but you, you can. Uh, you know, should we get sprinkled or should we get dunked? You can, you can doubt. You, and there's room for disagreements there. I will gladly give you room for that. Uh, should people speak in tongues or not? I will, I will grant you all of that. But on this issue, of whether you're in God's family, you shouldn't doubt. I, I would just ask you, do, do you doubt what family you're in? Physical family? So this morning, I want to I talk about feeding that doubt. Because if, if we can stop feeding that doubt, and if we can address those issues, and I, I'm going to share with you my story this morning, and I do understand my story is unique. But people are blown away, and I'm talking about at seminary, when I say I never doubted my salvation. Never, never. There, there's never been a time that I've doubted my salvation. And we're going to see why. And it's one of the three reasons I want to talk about this morning. So a lot of theologians will praise doubt, and I want to go right to the heart of the issue of doubt. I want to tell you that doubt is an enemy. And that people, even good people, that encourage you and try to... Uh, foster your doubt and say it's normal and everything, I think they're undermining what God wants to do. Good people, good people. Good people can do that. So I want to go back and I want us to look at the, the, where it all began. Where it all began. And I, want to, I want to lead us into where that doubt ended up taking us. Let's uh, op- open your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis will start in chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Yes, there was work. Before the fall, there was work. We had to tend it, but it was fulfilling work. It was, it was work that said, oh, there's a purpose to this. There's a, there's a reason for this, and, and, and I feel useful. I'm not just standing around. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free. This, this is the phrase. This is the money phrase right here we need to have. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Remember that phrase. Lock it down. God said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. But you are free to eat from any tree of the garden. This whole big place. And everything in it, you're free to eat from anything except that one tree. Now, we go on just a little bit later. And we get to chapter 3, and I want you to notice what happens here and the, and the tool that is used. Now, the serpent was more crafty, so we get an idea of, of the serpent's personality, more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say... You must not eat from any tree in the garden. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? What's he doing there? He's sliding in doubt. He's sliding in doubt. He uses that doubt as a wedge issue between Eve and between God. Did God really not say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And then he goes on. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. So we stay away from that tree. God didn't say stay away from the tree. He didn't say you can't touch it. You don't eat from it. She put up a, a rule to make sure. And then here it comes from the serpent. He says this, you will not certainly die. I think the King James says you will not surely die. What, what's just happened there? Doubt. God's told you one thing, doubt it. Your parents tell you one thing, doubt it. The pastor tells you one thing, doubt it. 
And he says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Hmm. Maybe God didn't tell me everything I was supposed to do. Maybe God held off. Maybe God didn't want me to know everything that he knows. Maybe God didn't want me to be like him. Doubt. 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 But in some Christian circles, in some evangelical circles, people say, oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Here's the way it ends up in the next verse. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom... She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And we know how that ended up. It started with a doubt. And there are people that say, if you doubt your relationship with God, it is a good thing. In fact, let me in, they'll say, let me encourage you to do that. And I'm just saying here to tell you that 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 is not the way Jesus operates. We don't have the verse. I don't, I don't want to put this first over here, but I'm going to give you a story. And that story is that when Peter is walking on the water, he's walking on the water to meet Jesus. And then he takes his eyes off Jesus, starts singing. He says, save me. And Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, why do you doubt? Jesus doesn't give brownie points for doubting. He doesn't. There, there's not this thing that where you get to come up in front of the class and you get your star, a star by your name because you were a doubter. Well, that, right, but, but, but I, can't, I can't help from doubt. I want to deal with three reasons you probably doubt. Three reasons. The first reason, uh, psychologists call this the family of origin. It is the family you grew up in. When you were small, when you were young, you grew up in a family, and your family did things a certain way. There were certain rules. There were certain things that if if the neighbor across the street, if your buddy across the street, if they did this, it wasn't a problem. If you did it, you got in trouble. Your family had certain rules and certain guidelines. And there were things that were okay and not okay in your family. Your family of origin can affect that. Do you think when, when that dad went out on that picture's mound. Do you know what everybody on those stands were thinking he was going to say? Not, I just came out here to tell you I love you. He was like, come on, you need this. I see the bigger picture. You want to be able to say in 20 years that your team won, that you won this game. You, you want to perform. You want to perform. And, and some of you grew up in families to where performance was all that matters. When you brought home a fort, the report card, your mother looked at all your report card, and having looked it over, what she pointed out was the, great, the, the worst grade. Disregarded all the A's and went to the D or the C or the F. In uh, February, um, a, a lady has a, an, an issue. Her husband leaves, leaves her. They've been married for two years. He, he leaves her, and uh, she doesn't know what she's going to do. She moves back in with her mother, and she's starting to feel sick in, in, in March. And in April, she goes and visits the doctor. And the doctor has to break this horrible news to her that she's pregnant. Well, her husband just left her. She literally leaps from the chair, grabs the doctor, and says, you've got to fix this. You've got to fix this. The person said, I can't, I can't fix this. And in October of that year, I was born. The year was 1960. And uh, mom uh, had, you know, she, 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 it was her childhood sweetheart, and he had left her. And then after I was born, mom had one of those figures that <laughs> popped back, you know. And so then this gentleman comes back into her life, and... Uh, Fifteen months later, my brother was born, but he he left again. So it's mom, it's the year is 1962, and it's mom and me and my brother. And um, that's pretty much the way it's going to be. And we're living with my grandmother. And there's a gentleman that meets my mom. He's working at the phone company. She's working at the phone company. He's an operator there. He's a cable splicer there. 
And um, he would come over, and they would go on dates. We would stay with Grandma. Again, I'm, I'm very young at this point. But, you know, the cards were kind of stacked against him because we started calling him Daddy. You know, we were talking, and that's kind of weird in and of itself. You know, you're dating this chick, but you don't, you, the Daddy kind of thing is not something you necessarily want. And, and, and um, he said, he said, uh, marry me. Marry me. She said, no, I'm done having kids. I have any more kids. And uh, he said, please marry me. Please marry me. And uh, she said, no. She said, I'll tell you what. She said, if you build me a house, I'll marry you. And the way mom tells the story, she says, dang, if he didn't go out and build me a house. <laughs> so uh, 1964, uh, the end of 19, but, you know, about this time of year, 1964, we move into a house and I'm four years old and mom and, and dad has gotten married. Um, and, you know, to, to wrangle me and my brother took a, a man that uh, knew a belt wasn't just for wearing around your waist. And me and my brother, we were wide open sports, uh, fights. If, if we didn't have anybody to fight with in the neighborhood, we'd fight with each other. You know, it's just like, we just had all this energy, all this energy. And, and it just, I mean, man, I, sane people would have left. What is it? These aren't my kids. I'm leaving. Uh, the sane person would have left. Um, I can remember I'm playing in a basketball tournament in high school, and I'm playing uh, down in, in another state. And, and we're war doing warm-ups, and I look up there, and there's my mom and dad up there. And I'm going, whoa, what in the world is this? Um, he did not adopt me proper. Because he always wanted to make sure that, that you know, I was, I was doing what I, what I wanted to do. And when I turned 18, I changed my name to his name. And so uh, then my brother followed suit when my brother turned, turned 18. And then uh, I go off to a Christian college, and I go to seminary, and one of the things I learn is that uh, your confidence in God is directly attached to your earthly father. In other words, if you, if you never, if, if you're secure in your earthly father's love, you'll be secure in your heavenly father's love. So I was kind of, and when I did my dad's funeral, I, I preached from the passage of, we have adoptions we are adopted into God's family. God adopts us. We call him Father, Abba Father, because he adopts us. And, and I used that passage when I preached his, his uh, funeral. And I told a lot of stories, stories where we got spanked, stories where we deserved to get spanked and didn't get spanked. You know, I just told a, a lot of st stories about it. But here's the deal, and I told Dad this one time. I said, you know, Dad, I've never doubted God's love for me because I never doubted your love for me. Never, never doubt it. Never doubt it. Now, some of you, you know, your, your family of origin, it was, your acceptance was based on performance, what you did, how you performed. And you started getting the feeling that if, if I perform well, then, then, then mom or dad like me more. But if I disappoint them, mom and dad like me less. No, your parents loved you. They might not have shown it well, but they loved you. And the family of origin, it's, it's not that I thought my dad could do anything. But the fact of the matter is, no matter what I did, I knew he never did not love me. I knew that. Now, we've been looking at coming into God's family, coming into faith. If you believe in Jesus for life, you believe him for his gift of life, you have eternal life. You've moved, you've passed, we looked at this last week, you've passed from death to life. And it happens at that moment you believe. Now, if you start getting squirrely there and you start thinking, well, did I do it right? Did I, did I perform right? Did I, did I jump through all the right hoops? To, you, got, you got to focus on the wrong wrong thing it's on your father your heavenly father 
So some of you emotionally will doubt and will struggle with this because you struggle with the love of your earthly father or your earthly mother. You just need to realize that's your problem, that's your earthly father's problem. It's not God's problem. Because no matter how good or how bad your earthly father was, God is better. God is the best. He's the best father. Your earthly father is just a picture of that authority, but he's not the full authority of of who God wants to be. Allow God, my my response would be, if you doubt in this area, allow God to have his own authority face. Allow, don't put your dad's face on God. Allow God to have his own place in your heart. Don't doubt his love for you. The second thing, as I, I would say, uh, is your desire for comparison or our, our, our temptation to compare. And it goes like this. Um, uh, I the best way for me to, to step into this is to give you a story. When uh, my first uh, few weeks at seminary, I was taking Greek. I came, went there early to take, get my baby Greek out of the way. And, and I met a ga- man, a friend of mine. He's been in this church. Um, he, he tells everybody had never made it through seminary without him. I tell people I wouldn't have made it through seminary without him. So, um, but he told me when he met me, he said he was an alcoholic. And I said, well, that's, that's odd. You know, I mean, to have AA meetings right here at seminary, I would think, you know, that's kind of odd. And, and I said, well, that's, you know, kind of, I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what to do with that. And, and uh, he said, oh, I haven't had a drink in 25 years. I said, well, that's odd kind of t- to say you're an alcoholic if you have not had a drink in 25 years. He said, but, you know, I get on an airplane and they start serving alcohol and I start shaking. Oh, okay, interesting. Now, I've met other people that had some problem before they came to Christ, whatever that problem was. And they'll say this, boy, God saved me. And let me tell you, he took away my desire. He saved me. My desire for alcohol was gone. I didn't never, never. My, my desire to smoke cigarettes was gone. My desire to you just name it, whatever you want to do, your little thing, it, it was gone. And so if you're my friend, you're sitting there saying, wait a minute. Why do they get to be released from whatever is undermining them? And, and I still got to struggle with it. That's not fair. And some people will say, well, it's probably because you're not saved. It's probably because you're not a Christian. You know, we experienced this in my family. My wife's family, my wife's parents were deaf. Her mom and her dad both were deaf. And as a little boy, they would take, they would take uh, her dad, he's six years old, they'd take him to these faith healing crusades and things like that and they would bring him up on stage and put their fingers in his ear and all like this you know can you hear can you? no i can't hear well then you don't have faith you don't have the faith that this person has or that person you don't have faith and you start comparing you say, god must not want me you know there's a couple of things i would say about this number one what god does with somebody else is god's prerogative Paul said this, he had a thorn in the flesh. God prayed, take this thorn away, but he chose not to take the thorn away. That's God's business. The other thing I would say is this. At the end of John John chapter uh, 21, um, uh, uh, Jesus is talking to to John, and uh, and, and Peter's overhearing him. And Peter asked a question about, you know, uh, what are you going to do with him? And he says, that's what I do with him is not any of your business. God loves you individually. And God knows the curriculum that you need to go to, through to become transformed to be more like Jesus. Don't compare yourself with others. Don't do it. Dr. Howard Hendricks used to tell us it's deadly. 
It's deadly. You compare your church with another church. You're preaching with another preaching. Don't do it. It is deadly. And some of you doubt because you look at what God's doing in someone else's life and you say, oh, wow, they've really got it going on. Uh, well, I must not be a Christian. No. no don't. That's the wrong basis for what, what you're judging yourself. Because the basis of you coming into God's family has nothing to do with what he does with someone else or does with you. It has everything to do with, with, with what he has done. Thirdly, some of you, you're, you're introspective. You're always going into your feelings. You're looking in. Rich Mullins had a song. He said, um, the, the, the boy said, uh, uh, oh, I'm going to miss the line on this. I had not planned on using it. It just hit me. Uh, uh, just follow your heart. But my heart just led me into my chest. Some of you are very introspective in your personality. And, and you're very feeling-oriented. You're very, very feeling-oriented. And I would say instead of being inside perspective, be Christ or cross-side perspective. You, you need to let the proof that Jesus loves you by what he did on the cross convince you that whatever is inside is moving. And it should be moving more to be like Christ. See, see I want you to know with confidence. It, it wasn't because I had a dad that was perfect, but I had a dad that I knew he would crawl over broken glass to reach me. He would do whatever it took to, to reach me. And with that kind of love, how could I think that God would do anything less? Jesus says, believe in me for life, for eternal life. And, and if you are feeding doubt, if you're thinking, well, it's okay for me to doubt, and it's proper and it's right for me to doubt. I would say just get your eyes on Jesus. You're either going to believe what he says about you and about him or you're not. And I, I can't help that. All I can do is say, here it is. You either believe it or you don't. He says that when you believe him for, for, for life, his gift of life, that you've moved from death to life. And we have that gift. It's given to us. You know, before I changed my name, I was acting like a Cheney before I changed my name. Because I was looking and I wanted to be more like my dad. I wanted to be more like him. He was my hero. And the fact of the matter is, as you look at Jesus... You want to be more and more like Jesus, and you want to follow him and follow his example. I want to end with this, this verse, because I've talked to some of you in this series as I'm going through this series, and some of you have said, yeah, you know, I struggle with that. Some of you have said, you know, I never struggle with it. Never. And, and, and someone this week, I forget who, said, you know, it's pretty simple to me. It just, just comes down to one verse, John 3, 16. So let's just look at it. For God so loved the world... God loved everybody that he gave his one and only son that whoever, and then what right here we stop and we want to change things out right here. Whoever pitches a perfect game shall not per perish but have everlasting life. Whoever joins a Baptist church will not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever is raised in a nice Catholic home will not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever gives up smoking, drinking, chewing, or going with girls that do those things will have, will not perish but have everlasting life. We suddenly slip things in there and we get confused and it's real simple. Whoever believes in him. It can't be that easy. Can't be. But that's what it says. Now, look. I, I will grant you, if you want to create your own world and, you know, you want to build your own kingdom, and you try, if you want to do all that, you can have your way of getting there. It, it doesn't say whoever uh, is baptized 
will not perish. Whoever uh, receives Mass or com communion or the Lord's Supper will not perish. It just says whoever believes. And it's in its simplicity that we undermine what he wants to do. Look, once you know you're in God's family and you're secure in that and you're assured of that and you know it's not because of what you've done, it's because of what he's done. Once you know that it's not based on your performance, but it's based on his performance and his promise, whew, things get a lot easier. Things get a lot easier. You know, I, I, I'm one of these guys that I'm always trying to make something better. I am. I had a 69 Volkswagen. If you can make a 69 Volkswagen better, you've done something. But by golly, I tried. I put wheels on it, silver wheels. I painted it. <laughs> And people said, Rod, Rod, just change the oil in the thing, Rod. Just say, no, 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 I've got, to, I've got to do something. And we're always trying to improve what God's done. God desires that you, your family, your friends, hear that he's provided the gift of life by what he's done. People either believe him for that. Or well, they say, no, I got a better way. I mean, with this, my granddad. My granddad and I used to just argue, argue, argue. He was a, a person of the, um, of the Great Depression, you know, and, and he knew how hard life could be with the Great Depression. And, and uh, his dad died early in, a, in a, uh, a car, actually hit him, and he died. And granddad would always tell me, yeah, but you got to live it too. He would always say that. I'm no theologian, but I know you got to live it. And granddad, you know, don't, don't drink and smoke. Don't do. Now, granddad had his own pack of sins. So let me just tell you, he had his own pack of sins. But the sins that he thought God really worried about were the ones he wasn't doing. I'm just saying that's the way. Yeah, granddad. But I can remember on my granddad's deathbed, he looked with his eyes to me. And, and it was like the realization, yeah, I can't do this. But you know who can? Jesus can. And all your quitting and starting won't help it. Stopping doing this, starting doing that. It's what he's done. So don't feed your doubt. And anybody that tells you doubt's a good thing, it's good, good, good. No. No. Because like I said last week, it would crush every parent in here if their child did not know that they loved him. It'd crush him. And if you don't know God's incredible, irrational love for each and every one of, uh, of us, then I don't, I just, I don't know. See a therapist, do something. Because he loves us. And now, we're walking free. We're walking free free let's pray father thank you that regardless of the battles that go on inside us thank you that you stay steady thank you that your promises are true thank you that we cannot improve on the plan that you have put into place Thank you that although it's simple from our perspective, it was hard from your perspective. You did all the work. You carried that load. And Father, for some of us here, well, we grew up in families with loving parents and we've never doubted their love. And, and thankfully, when we came into the family of faith by simple faith in what Christ had done for us, when we came to believe Him and accept His gift of eternal life, it was all good, and we were secure in that. But so, some of us, if we're honest, we struggle. When we pray to you, we see our, our dad or our mom's face who, who put themselves first. But that's not you. You haven't put yourself first. Your desire to be with us in eternity outweighed everything it made it to where you would go 
and suffer and provide sin's payment for us. So I just pray that if we're wrestling with our family of origin, that you would, uh, you would just minister to us and, and heal us and help us see the good God that you are. And Father, if, we're, if we've allowed the sin of, of pride or comparison to come in, may we realize that how you deal with us will eventually transform us to be more like Jesus. And, and if we look in, introspectively, help us to put our eyes on Jesus and what he's done. Help us to, to not feed doubt, but to walk in faith. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hi, friends. I'm Olivia. I'm Rod. And you're listening to Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church. In today's episode, we are covering the October 8th sermon titled Feeding Doubt. And we are still in our series on assurance And so let's talk about the title real quick, because I'm guessing that we don't want to feed doubt. (laughs) That's correct. We want doubt to be on a very strict diet. And oftentimes, willingly or not, we end up feeding doubt and encouraging doubt in our lives. So that's why I got the title, Feeding Doubt, because we just we do it all the time. And I'm going to start off because in the sound booth, I have... I guess, special knowledge, I see what you have in your presentation. And there was one thing that we didn't get to in the sermon, but you had a slide and it says, just because someone plays Beethoven badly doesn't mean Beethoven was a bad composer. Just because someone lives the Christian life poorly doesn't mean that Jesus isn't worth following. God doesn't ask you to be like Christians. He asks you to be like Jesus Christ. That's a big difference. And that quote is from Bob Russell. So can you explain how that was going to work into your message? That was my second point when I was talking about things we do. We compare ourselves with other Christians. And when we do that, we either come out really well because we can find Christians that really stink at what it means to be a Christian. They falter, they fail, and they say, well, well, at least I'm not them. And that's the wrong uh, mode. That's the wrong measuring rod. We're to be like Christ. And we can never fully measure up to that. So it really drives us back to grace instead of performance. And really what I was going after there was that we tend to compare our experiences with the experiences of others. And if they were they had a struggle and they came to Christ and uh, they ended up accepting his gift of salvation, and then all of a sudden they, they no longer had that struggle— and they will tend to speak with spiritual airs, as it were. They'll, they'll have this, this air about them. And um, we compare ourselves to them, and we look to them, and then we start doubting. Well, wow, if that happened to them and it didn't happen to me, therefore I must not be a Christian. And so I think that's one way we can feed doubt is by letting other people be the standard instead of Jesus being the standard. And you had two other examples or two other reasons why we might doubt our salvation. So the other was your family of origin. And that was related to the video clip. You know, you grew up in a family that did things a certain way, and they, uh, some of those, uh, the way they did things, they might lead you to wrongly assume that their love for you was based on your performance, that their acceptance of you was based on how well you performed, how good you were. And so we end up, a lot of times, we carry that in to our relationship with God. And, and I told my story in this, uh, in this sermon, and I never, ever had a doubt of my salvation because I knew that regardless of my performance, my father loved me, and he loved me unconditionally. And it wasn't based on my performance. It was based on his character and he had proven himself over and over again to be faithful in his love for me. So when someone shared with me the good news that Jesus had 
died on the cross for me and he offered me eternal life, I just didn't think that he could go back on that or that he would go back on that, regardless of my performance. Um, And so some of us struggle with this whole concept of feeling, and this message was about feeling, feeling like we've done enough, feeling like we're in God's family, being assured of that, because we might come from a family who played by a different set of rules than what God plays by. So the last one was introspection, and that's more looking at yourself to see if you, is it that you feel like you're secure in your salvation or you feel like you're doing enough? What, what was the, explain the introspection part. Yeah, and if there's just one more thing that, that I wish I would have added to this message is, uh, I think the perfect example of introspection is your mother. Uh, your mother is the best human being I know running away. I mean, you're talking about Gail Cheney. Yes, for those listening. <laughs> that's right. I mean, she is the best human being, not only because she puts up with me, but she she puts up with a lot of other things. But uh, the first few years of our marriage, your mother is very introspective. She she very much wrestles with, you know, not being good enough. And you know, I, all I can say is I've never. I've never been under the assumption that I could make it to heaven by anything other than God's grace. If you could be good enough to get there, your mother would qualify. But of course, no one can be good enough. And so her focus was how well she was doing, how well she was living out the Christian life. Now, that in and of itself was defined by others. Well, good Christians do this or don't do that. You know, preachers would say, "Hey, if if you don't feel comfortable, you're you're probably going to hell." If uh, look at your life, look at your life, and Jesus doesn't tell us to do that. He says, "Look at this gift; it has been paid in full." So my point there was that there are people, and I don't know if I said this or not, but your mother doubted her salvation for like the first three years of our marriage. And there are people that look at their lives and that, that always feel like they'll, they'll never be good enough. And while that's true, that's not the basis of their acceptance into God's family. It's not based on their performance again, how good they are, how good they, they, they might not be. It's based on what Christ has done and what Christ provides. Absolutely. And if you if you're struggling with this issue of assurance of salvation, you know, you can feel free to email us at ask at isunrise.org. That's A S K at I Sunrise, the letter I sunrise.org. And we're gonna point you right back to scripture because um that's where your security and that's where your assurance should come from, in the performance of Christ and not in your own performance. I thought my video clip was was great, even though it was, you know, about six, seven years old. A father walks to the mound during the Little League World Championship, and he comes out there. He's the coach, but the pitcher is also his son. And the first thing he says to you, I just came out here to tell you I love you. And, and that's what that kid needed to hear. And, and I'm just thinking that 90-plus percent of other fathers who might be in that position would not have said that. They would have talked about and targeted his performance. And Jesus just comes to us, and in our failures and in our victories, he says he loves us. He says, this is what I've given you. I've given you this gift of salvation. And you should never doubt his irrational love for you. You you should never have to doubt that because it's, it's based on his character, not yours. And praise God for that. Amen. Well, thanks for breaking that down and explaining that. And thank you all for listening to another episode of Just One More Thing from Sunrise Church.